Okay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm LD Hernandez. I am one of two engineers working on the Ranger. The other one is Andrew McLeod, who couldn't make it today, but he's joining us virtually. Um, I'll give a brief intro, intro to, uh, to the Ranger, and then I'll talk about the stuff that we've been doing this year and what will come later this year and in subsequent releases. So, the Ranger is an on-demand property propagation engine, or as I like to call it, a six-month project that turned into a decade of our lives. Um, originally, it started as a way to catch corner cases that VRP wasn't catching, and then it evolved into a generic on-demand property propagation engine um, that's very well suited to do VRP, but it could do other stuff. <clears throat> The main outline of this talk is to talk about the steps we took this year to make the Ranger type agnostic, so it would work not only on integers and pointers, but on floats and have the ability to work on a variety of different things. Uh, the work going in to do floating point ranges, which is something that we've wanted to do for a long time in GCC and weren't able to do at all and how to enhance the Ranger without any, um, any intimate knowledge of the Ranger itself. And then upcoming work. So the first one of these, and feel free to stop me at any time with questions, the first one of, this, of these is the type agnostic Ranger. From the very beginning, it became clear that, yes? So from here on, okay or I can look at here. Um, from from the, from the get-go, we realized that Ranger was generic enough that it could handle other types, not just integers and pointers, which was what VRP had been doing all along. So it was our goal this year, one of the main goals to make, uh, to make sure that the concept of a type was decoupled from the Ranger as a whole. Um, to do this, the first thing we did was abstract the data structures that the Ranger worked on. And this is actually what we came up with. This is an abstract class defining what a, what a blob that the Ranger propagates. <clears throat> As you can see, I've, I've, I've focused on the, the red bits are, oh, the red bits are, the more common things that the Ranger works on, basically the ability to set a set covering the entire domain, that's called varying, the ability to set the empty set, that's called undefined, and basically just set operations, union, intersect, singleton, contains. If, <clears throat> if you provide the Ranger with anything uh, that derives from vRange, it, it, it can propagate whatever property you want across a CFG and you can query it. The next step after getting <clears throat> vRange v -range set up was the, uh, was the ability to deal with temporaries. Even if we make Ranger type agnostic, we still need temporaries on the stack to do um, operations. So we came up with uh, something very annoyingly in camel case, as you can see, value range, because we already have a temporary class for VRP called value range, and our goal is to eventually re replace all the value ranges in the compiler by this, um, by this generic class that works on a variety of different types. The goal, as you can see, it has a integer temporary, it has a floating point temporary and it has a little blob that basically has no space that just means that the range is not supported. And at any point, there's a pointer, pointer to, the, to what temporary we're talking about. And this provides an easy way for the ranger to declare temporaries and work within the same API as vRange can work in with no changes to the source code. Is that kind of sort of clear? Why is that not a union? Um, I played with a union and then it was unclear which one was live at any one point, but we could definitely entertain that if it is a better solution. But I, I did work on that originally. It, it didn't give me the results I wanted and we went with, with a pointer. 
I could dig up my own notes to, because to be honest, I don't remember exactly the details. Okay, so once we got the Ranger working generically, the next piece of the puzzle was being able to stream out ranges to GC space. We've done this for the longest time in, GC, in GCC, and for those of you familiar with, with, uh, with uh, our SSA implementation and with VRP, we had something called SSA name range info where we stored global ranges that could be used from pass to pass. However, we had various limitations in, global, in, in the global range storage. One, we couldn't store a full resolution uh, ranges because of this abomination in the way that we store ranges, which were uh, this thing called uh, an anti-range. And the only thing we were able to store was two endpoints or the opposite of an endpoint. So numbers from three to five or anything not three to five. And the reason we did that was to save space and it worked really good for a long time, but it also meant that we lost information when we intersected, when we intersected ranges and it become very clear from the gun that if Ranger kept really good ranges going in, it was very hard to stream them out and for other passes to, to, to get at them without running the full Ranger again because we'd lose information. Um, also, uh, streaming out full resolution ranges is, is a problem for things that have a lot of SSA names, like let's say uh, LTO of Firefox has a lot of SSA names and if we attach a range to each one of them, uh, storing full resolution um, ranges is, is, is a performance penalty. So what we did was we squished down the range to the minimum representation, um, to, to, the, to the minimum number of sub ranges that could be represented and then we stream it out. And I say that we can be as efficient as we make it because we are free to play with this and only stream two or three sub pairs or whatever. In, in our tests, we found that no matter how many ranges we allow Ranger to generate, in reality, anything past three is probably overkill for anything um, apart from a switch. So right now we're streaming five at the most, five pairs. But we can, we can play with that and bring it down to three or four. And then for things like switches, we could always calculate them on demand. Uh, the last point being that the global range storage, I mean, uh, that is SSA name range info, uses the same API as before. So if a pass knows some information about a range and it wants to update the global range, it uses the same API, basically feed it a range, I mean, feed it an SSA and a range and all the right things will happen. So there were very minimal changes to the actual source code. Now, once this was in play, the ability to, of, of the ranger to work agnostically with, with regards to types, uh, we needed a proof of concept to show that it worked. And Andrew and I discussed a couple ideas on what sh we should work on next for this. Uh, the, Number one was disambiguating the, the notion of integers and pointers in an in integer class and in a pointer class. Having a separate pointer class would allow us to do stuff like pointer tracking, pointer tracking plus offset. And another thing we could work on was floating points. We discussed this for a bit and Andrew basically said that it would be a fool's errand to take on floating point ranges. And I am happy to report that I am that fool and for the last two months, I've been working on floating point ranges, mainly because they're fun um, and mainly because they're, and also because there's a, low, a lot of low hanging fruit in GCC with regards to, to ranges and floating point because we don't do them at all. Um, if you look back in PRs, there's PRs requesting floating point ranges in VRP. Uh, I, I think there's like 20 year old PRs asking for this. So this is a known limitation of GCC. Uh, that I wanted to work on. So for the rest of my talk, I'll talk about the things that we handle with floating points right now, and then I'll talk about what's missing and how the community can help in implementing them without any knowledge of Ranger. I'll cover what we do in order of 
easier to hardest in terms of implementation for me personally. And the first thing we were able to do was dealing with symbolic relational operators. For example, if we know that X is greater than Y, on the true side, we could fold the second conditional because we know that X cannot equal to Y. We could do that pretty much without knowledge of nons and other things because we know that anything on the true side automatically doesn't have any nons. Uh, we were able to do this with a relational oracle that we have that is completely, uh, that has nothing to do with ranges, that is built on top of the ranger. And, but right off the gun, it was pointed out that what we really wanted to do was track nons. So that was my, my second job, was to teach the F range, and when I talk about F range, I mean the blob that I inherit from V range that supports representing ranges. So for those of you familiar or not familiar with floating point, there's the concept of a non, which is not a number. And we know that on the true side of any conditional with the exception of not equal, we know that both operands are not a non. So right, out, right off the gun, we know that we can record that X and Y are not nons. We also know that X cannot be negative infinity because negative infinity can't be greater than anything. And we also know that Y cannot be positive infinity because nothing can be greater than infinity. So these things we were able to model inside the F range object without any knowledge of actual, without actually keeping an actual range. So as I said originally, Ranger provides the ability to propagate properties across the CFG, and they don't have to be actual ranges. But what good is VRP and what good is a ranger if you don't model actual ranges? Which brings me to my next point, and this is when things got interesting, at least for me, or difficult. Um, we started tracking endpoints in a range. So for example, on the true side, of X is greater than or equal to five, we know that X is not an N as before, but we also know that X is, is within the interval five to positive infinity. But on the, on the opposite side, on, on the false side, we know that sure, X could be negative infinity to 5.0, but could also be a non. So we had to model that in the object. Um, for, for the clever reader, you'll notice that I am not exactly modeling um, the false side because the false side should be an open interval here of numbers below 5.0. And this is the reason I modeled them with, um, with closed intervals was because A, it was easy to get it up and running and because we wanted to prove everything was correct before we went in, off into the weeds. Also, the way of representing, we could, we could represent it with, with subranges as we have done for I range, but if we learned anything from the I range work is that because it becomes incredibly hard to, to do the math and all the intervals and do it correctly and do it in a way that it doesn't take a lot of, a, a lot of CPU time. So <clears throat> for now, it's an open interval and it is conservatively correct, as I like to say, because in the world of, of VRP, um, having more items in a set is always correct, whereas having less items in the set is a big problem. If you remove an item from the set that should be there, we may fold a conditional, we may do a jump thread that we shouldn't have done. So having a little bit extra in the set is still correct by the same way that we represent a number that we don't know by the entire domain. Uh, we call it varying, but that's fancy word for negative infinity to positive infinity. Plus nine. Plus nine, right. <clears throat> And, 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 and that's true. In the varying, we keep, we set the nons for all architectures for every, for every mode. So, got that. I was on a roll. I thought everything was working. And then I noticed right away that there's this concept of sign zeros. And being the newbie that I am to floating point, I was very frustrated very quickly. Um, and this is a problem for for VRP, or at least for me anyhow, while implementing it. Because on the true side of the first conditional, 
even though we know that x is 0, 0.0, we are not free to propagate any value of zero into either one of these unless we're sure about the sign. So I had to go back to the drawing board and model the sign across the floating point, um, the, the object. I know you're laughing, but we'll get there. And then Jakob suggested that if we're modeling uh, the sign and we're keeping track of the sign, that would be also nice to keep track of the, non, the signs and nons because uh, was it signaling nons or whatever, something we could optimize away? Okay, so anyway, keeping, keeping track of the signs was important for nuns, and it would be nice if we could also keep track. So I, I went into modeling this, and I submitted my patch, and at some point, Richie noticed that I was keeping track of maybe nuns in, in, in the object, and he didn't like that, and I fought with him for a little bit, and then I realized he was right, and, and it turned out into a much cleaner implementation by uh, tracking, uh, well, not tracking the sign, but devising it from the actual range itself and keeping a set of Boolean variables here. But in any case, uh, that's neither here nor there. The, the end result is that this is what we do so far. We keep track of the signs. We can propagate the correct zero if we know the sign. Uh, we have intervals that are a bit optimistic because we keep them in enclosed interval format. Um, we propagate nuns as well, and we do symbolic relational uh, operators that we fold. And this is good enough to do VRP, and it's good enough to do uh, jump threading. Uh, I've seen some interesting jump threading paths that we now get because the, the backwards threader, because of the work we did last year, uh, uses a ranger as a client and is able to fold now paths containing floating point. Um, however, what good is all this if you don't expose it to the other passes and if you don't expose it to the users? So we implemented uh, FB classify like API. For those of you familiar with the, with the C library, um, this is a way, if you take the prefix away, this is a way of asking if a number is a non or infinity or if it's known to be a finite, and we decided to go on a, to use the same API, but prefix it with maybe and known, because in the world of ranges, you can never be absolutely, you can sometimes be sure, if you know something is a non, but most of the time you can, what you want to ask if it, a range has the possibility of including a non. So, with all this, my next step was going through PRs, long-standing PRs on floating point and see what can we get right now with the infrastructure in place. And there's a couple PRs that I went through, and I'm like, yeah, we could, we, you know, we handle all these cases, we keep track of it, it's just now up to the optimization passes or the code generate uh, uh, expand to be able to make the right decisions based on the SSA info that we have regarding floats. However, I went to one of the first PRs that we have regarding floating point, and I will spare everyone the, the details of the PR, but we weren't able to do much with this. This is, this is a snippet within, within a loop, and basically at the end of the loop, we know that, um, we know what the range is. We know, we know that, the, that the final conditional is within the range of zero to 2.0, but that's about it. We don't know anything else because we don't know how to solve all this. So, and this is where I'll go into how to expand the ranger without any knowledge of, of the ranger itself. Did you have a question, David? The details don't matter. It's just, suffice to say that given, given two ranges, we don't know how to do the plus. And this is something that we do very well for integers. And when I say we, I, I mean GCC as a whole, we've had a lot of knowledge over the years. Um, VRP has been around for, I don't know, 17, 20 years. And we have built a cadre of information about how to solve, um, how to solve 
uh, operations on ranges that are integers and pointers. And we have stolen all that code and put it in range ops independently of, of the ranger, independently of Gory, independently of all the other pieces. We have an infrastructure in which you give it two ranges and it knows how to solve a, an operator. And that's where I'll go into next. This is a template for how to add a new operator. In this case, the plus. If you look at, the, at range op float, whatever, where we, where we implement them, you'll see that there's nothing there except relationals. That's, that was the extent of the original work and that was my plan all along. Because it was my desire for the community to help out filling in the operations because I'm not a floating point expert. <clears throat> and I figured if I make it simple enough for, the, for others to contribute, they can, they can do it without any knowledge of the ranger itself. Now, this is how we describe an operator. It's basically a fancy way of being able to fold a binary operator. We also do unary operators, but, but I won't go into the details. It's, it's similar. How to solve a binary operator between two operands. You take a range, you take a type, and you take two ranges. And you set the resulting range here, and you return true. That's all you have to do at the, at the basic level. Here, set varying is a fancy talk. It's fancy talk for saying we don't know anything and it's just the entire domain and maybe a non as well. Which is the entire domain. Sorry? Which is the entire domain, right. So the entire domain. And then the next thing you do is you add it to the table and that's it. Any time that Ranger encounters this operation, it'll call into fold range to get the result. And that's it. This is a way of describing the math nothing else. It has no concept of SSA names, it has no concept of flow graph, nothing. This is at the, at the lowest level and it can be used completely independent of, 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 the, of the ranger. But you have then those hooks that where you can do the backwards? Yes, and that's Gory. I could go into that if you guys like later, but Gory is one step above that that uses um, the, 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 range op, the range op tables to do a, a backwards, a backwards path through the IL, solving things all the way uh, to the top. For example, if we have at the end of a basic block, if X is greater than zero, GORI, which stands for uh, generates outgoing range info. Andrew came up with the names. Don't. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a way to state within a block. Gory doesn't know how to go beyond a block. All it does is work within a block and it can say, you can say, what is the range of X on the true side? Or what is the range of X on the false side? You know, in this case, it's easy. The range of, of X on the true side is uh, one, at least in integers, it's one to infinity and, and vice versa on the false side. But suppose you know that x equals y plus seven. So on the true side, you can also ask Gory what the range is on the true side or the false side, and it'll chase back the definitions within the basic block to tell you what the, what the possible ranges are for y, so on and so forth. But as I said, it has no concept of things living outside of the block. So if it, so Ranger sits one, one, one level above that and actually does the propagation itself. Now, if, if Gory can't figure out what's, you know, what, what comes outside of this block, it can figure out by calling Gory. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so that's the general template. We also have ways of doing the opposite. I mean, of, of solving for op one and op two. So it's just math at this point. Instead of fold range, we have something, we have another method called op range, op one range, which given operand two and given the result, you can solve for op one. The math gets interesting, but it's just math of, 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 of objects. So <clears throat> this ranger would use, for example, for example, the op one range ranger would use to solve for y in this case. So. It just does basic math, it has no concept of SSA or nothing, it's just pure math. Now, 
I will go into what needs to happen here to go from a template to implementing the plus operator. And before you guys get bogged down by the details, I want you to look at the red bits, which is the way that me as a newbie in floating point, re the way I reason about solving an, an operation is just you handle the NANDs going in. If you're sure it's an ANDs, one of the operands is an on that you return an on. If otherwise you do the math, then when you do the math, you adjust for nons. And then once you adjust the nons, if you're absolutely sure the result is not an on and the operands are not an on, then you know the whole thing cannot be an on and you clear the bit and that's it. That's the way I reason originally. And I thought it would be a cinch to solve this by implement what I'm hiding from here by doing a lot of hand waving, which is a fringe arithmetic. Now, I implemented the first go at this in a few lines and Jakob laughed at me um, because I thought that the way of doing it is, it's, it's easy, it's math, right? You add A and C, um, that's the lower bound. You add B and D, that's the upper bound, you're done. And I sent it to Jakob and I said, I'm giving this presentation, do you think this will solve the PR? And he said, no. Well, yes, but in, in a lot of cases, no. And I'm like, why? He says, well, um, the real value type, which is the internal representation for floats that GCC uses, uh, can make mistakes or it can give inexact answers. So you need to check that the arithmetic coming out of it did not give inexact answers because that, inter that internal representation needs to be translated and in converted into the target format. So you can lose precision going in, you can lose precision coming out, and you need to adjust the range for that. So I said, all right, well, that, well that's easy. You do the math. If it's inexact, you saturate towards the right infinity and you quit. And I send it back to Jakob and Jakob says, no, that's stupid because you're, that's a big hammer. You can't just arbitrarily put stuff to negative infinity. We can do better than that. So it turns out that you need to make sure that if things were inexact going in, that you saturate towards a side, saturate one op to the appropriate infinity instead of going all the way to negative infinity and so on and so forth. And, and you need to make sure that in your conversion to the target format that you ended up with the same number because if you didn't end up with the same number, there was some loss of precision in there and you also need to adjust it and open the right direction. Does that make sense? So yeah, I, I guess one of the issues is that our real value arithmetic doesn't know rounding modes or how to do them. Does it otherwise, know? So otherwise you could set round to, uh, round to negative infinity on if you're doing the left uh, thing and then it would do it for you, but I don't think it can do that right now. Yeah, uh, it, it's true, it, it, it doesn't have it implemented, so, so that's, but we can implement it, I think, because uh, if you do the real arithmetics and it tells you the, the result is inexact, uh, then well, if it's exact, we, we are done. Uh, if it's not exact, then then you can round it to, uh, to the right mode and uh, then you can compare what you round it uh, against uh, the uh, internal representation number. And depending on which, which direction you are uh, rounding to, if to uh, positive infinity or negative infinity, uh, based on the comparison of the two numbers, you can find which, uh, which, uh, which direction it rounded. And based on that, you either just use that number or you uh, do real uh, uh, next, uh, next after uh, towards the infinity to get. Yeah, so, so what I was uh, trying to get after is maybe we should see to put something that does this for you into real.c instead of yeah. just doing it inside Ranger because it might be useful in other places as well. Yeah. And the other, uh, other question is when exactly we should do this 
enlarging of the inexact values uh, towards uh, the the two infinities based on on which uh, which uh, initially I think we we've done it only for the flag rounding map and, right. and for the complex mode, but I I think I, I would do it exactly always because there are I think two two important uh, cases which which we don't handle. One is the excess precision. In in case of express, excess precision, it could be slightly above or slightly below because it's it's in higher precision. Then we have stuff like FMA, where also we have higher precision, basically infinite precision for the for the first operation, and then yeah, uh, what what else? Didn't, wasn't there something you mentioned about uh, 386 floating point with regard to storing stuff on the stack? Yeah, yeah that, that's the excess precision. Okay. That's the excess precision. And, and we, we have, yeah, 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 the contraction is, is in the other case. Did you have a question? So, so the, 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 that's probably corner cases with infinity, depending on, on how the target format handles, like overflow there and how real that is if you're just at the corner but rounded in the wrong di direction that you get to the infinity correctly or not but so I, 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 I think so, so I, I think for, for all of the, the this kind of arithmetics inside the, the, the core mechanics I wouldn't do any fast math optimization so just try to be correct yeah. okay on, on all cases and and all the fast math would be on the folding side right and not during the propagation. Okay. I mean, there may be, I think you posted the patch with the denormals, which we should right. flush or not. Which I haven't posted. And, and I'm, I'm, I didn't make up my mind yet if I should reply or try to do that only at substitution or folding time and not during the range operation. So I'm. Actually, excited. Richard R R R Richard and I were talking about the same thing, and he had suggested that maybe we should be always assuming that the hardware can turn, ha has it turned on and that we should always. Uh, flush to zero when we see it in normal, but we can certainly keep talking about this. Yeah, the, <coughs> la the last time the line here disappears, but the, the, where you said non, non bit or not. Uh, if you have oh. plus infinity plus negative infinity, it gets a non, and that's not handled here. I don't. I didn't get that. Anybody get that? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, uh, the uh, the last line here is wrong. The clear non bit. It's also wrong for infinities. If you have positive infinity plus negative infinity, that's a num. It's not handled here. Yes, positive m minus non yeah, is yeah, is a non, and I already covered that. I'll go into that next. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's uh, right there for the fast math thing. Oh. I just wanted to say we need to remember this is range arithmetic here, so it's fine if we are overshooting a bit on the right side, <laughs> of course. So it's, it's undershooting, it's not overshooting. It's setting uh, oh, it's sorry, I was clear, not, clear now. I was not answering you. Uh, it, just, it, it was a general remark that uh, we want to be careful. No, we want to be careful, of course, always, but we don't have to be overly correct in the results as right. long as we are a little bit larger or lower than the correct result. Okay, before we spend, we can continue talking about this after the talk, because I have like three more slides. The gentleman over there had a question or comment. Well, I don't know exactly how it's handled, but I was wondering about subnormals, whether there are some issues which they sometimes get flushed to zero or not, depending on. That's what legs. we were just talking. Okay. Just yes, that I posted a patch flushing things, and we could definitely continue upstream the discussion. But for the for the fast math, I think for for the signed zeros, we we I think we have an agreement what to do. That basically, if 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 the user says. Uh, well, if the hardware has signed zeros, but the user says don't care, uh, in the documentation it's basically described as uh, the user doesn't care whether he gets minus zero or uh, plus zero right. if, if it's zero. So in that case, we need in the setter extend always to the right. Uh, and, and, and this so was an issue both. doing the non stuff as well. What if the user says they don't want nons, but there's one in the in the IL that we didn't put there that came from the source? Anyway, uh, 
there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there is also mode composite P, which is, I think it's IBM long double stuff that has non-contiguous mantises or something, and there's multiple representations for the same number, and we need to be very careful lest we propagate the wrong one. So anyway, the goal, my goal has been to abstract Jakob and Richie and everybody else that knows all about this into, into a function. So that, so that folks working on, on, uh, on implementing the remaining, or all, actually all of the operators in the range up tables can do so without having to worry about all these details because I certainly don't understand them. Oh wait, before, uh, Will asked me a question about what, what good is, I mean, how often can we fold conditionals with, 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 with V or P in, in floating point? Does this ha happen often enough like it does for, for integers? And, and the answer to that is that it doesn't exactly matter because what, one of the main things we want to do is be able to propagate uh, nons and be able to do optimizations based on that and being able to choose uh, cheaper alternatives during code generation because we know that, for example, uh, x86, I think it's x86 has a fast square root function, a, a square root one, that you, it doesn't work with nons, it doesn't work with negatives, it doesn't work with a couple corner cases. And the, the backend doesn't know to generate that that square root instruction or not, but if we can, if we're sure it doesn't have a non, if we're sure all these restrictions are in place, we can call the fast path. The, the instruction actually handles it right, but uh, doesn't set Erno, so. Ah, so it's Erno, okay. So we can do better instruction selection because we know that things are within a range, even though we can't actually fold away a conditional. Um, also for, uh, I believe it's, and I'm not a math person, I think it's, uh, transcendental functions in glibc, there's a lot, there's a preamble for trigonometric functions in which we check for the corner cases, which are nons and zeros and negatives and whatever and things within a range. And then if, 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 if that, if none of these exceptional cases um, happen, we could do things faster sometimes. I think it's arctangent that we can, we can generate code with reciprocal divisions instead of doing this complicated thing. It would, it would be very nice in the future if GCC could emit proper dispatch. We could call a cheaper version of, of LIPC, and that's certainly something for future exploration. So, so all in all, we can, with the work right now, we can aid uh, targets to generate better code, to select uh, better instructions or cheaper instructions. Uh, we have the ability to maybe work with the library developers to choose uh, cheaper uh, implementations as well. Uh, we do value range propagation. We do jump threading. And I think any other, other clients of Ranger also benefit from this. I think it's loop header copying as well uses the Ranger, and it might benefit from working with Ranger inputs, maybe. Um, basically, we have enough to do everything we've been doing for integers. What is missing to get it 100% right are the, actual, um, are, are the actual math functions. And I'm hoping with this talk to encourage some people that know about the math but don't know about Ranger to work on it, hopefully by showing that it's not that difficult if you know what you're doing. It might be more difficult to me, and if we can abstract, if we can abstract out the details of the rounding modes and IBM long double and all that stuff, it um, may be easy to do so. So, future Ranger work. I've already talked about what I'd like to improve in uh, if in floating uh, in, in the F range world. There's also other things I'd like to work on in this release, or actually Andrew and me. Uh, we'd like to finally replace VRP with Ranger. We have, traditionally we've had three VRP passes, EVRP, VRP1, VRP2. 
EVRP and VRP2 are using Ranger. All, we're, all that's missing is VRP1. We'd like to do that, and once we can do that, we'd like to convert all the trees inside the I range to Y dense, because there's a, there's a lot of dancing between trees and Y dense, and there's, there's a performance penalty in all this. There's also a performance penalty in the I range in keeping track of legacy, of, of legacy anti ranges as well. Um, there's, last time we ran numbers, which was a couple years ago, to be honest, there is a three to six percent increase in performance for VRP just by get by going back to to wide ends. We don't have to convert this stuff back and forth. Granted, as we talked about recently, trees must remain at some point in the ranger to be able to do equivalence. I mean, to do, be able to do symbolic stuff. But for the low level I range stuff, we should get rid of trees entirely. Uh, there's also P range, which I briefly. Uh, touched at the beginning of the talk, we'd like to disambiguate I range uh, integers and pointers within the I range and provide a separate um, object for pointers. And we may be able to do pointer tracking and pointer tracking plus offset. I had a prototype for that and it caught everything we are already doing in traditional, um, in, uh, in legacy VRP plus more. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing the work. Yes. So if you're tracking pointer plus offset, that's probably everything that uh, the symbolic range propagation does. It does it tracks SSA name plus constant offset. Right. So you can possibly reuse parts of that to to not oh, progress on the where symbolic is this? range. So where, where is this? Is this the stuff that comes from match.m? No, that, that that's that's basically the, the, the how how we restrict the symbolic ranges in the assert expressions okay. in the old VRP. They, they need to be of certain form. We don't know, we don't allow arbitrary generic expressions, but it's, it's always symbol plus or minus constant. Okay. And then the, the, the range operator, and again, symbol plus minus offset. So it's, it's possibly what you're doing for pointer ranges. Now. And actually, I think, at least for EVRP, we took what VRP was doing originally, which was calling to fold, I think, and using the fancy machinery to do some of the math. And we could certainly use that and what you just said. But yeah, let's talk later about that. Uh, there's fat, uh, this, has been on the, this has been on the docket for a long time. We just haven't got around to it because there's been other stuff on our plate. But it's been mentioned over and over again that having the ability to do uh, to have a fast ranger even at O0, something the way EVRP worked before, not doing back edges, uh, is definitely doable. Is just a matter of shuffling priorities. So that's more like GCC 14, and the last remaining ones are GCC 14 items. Um, as part of the work last year, we replaced, I believe it was out of the nine jump threading passes that we have in the compiler, we replaced seven of them with a backwards threat, with a new backwards threader that is ranger based. Uh, the only remainder, remaining use of the forward threader is DOM. And the only reason it's there is because it needs to be disassociated from DOM and also because DOM does we, uh, Richie talked about value numbering. Their scope tables do floats, pointer equivalences, and does other stuff that I range hasn't been able to, that, that the ranger hasn't been able to do, but, but now with, with F range, we can do. So next year, am I coming in and out? Is it cutting off? No. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to dis disassociate the threader from DOM, and once we do that and we're catching all the cases, then it's time to get rid of the backwards threader. I'm sorry, once we do that, we can get rid of the forward threader, which puts us in a position to get rid of DOM because I think FRE, if I'm not mistaken, gets everything that, or should get everything. And if not, somebody needs to sit down, probably me, to find out what FRE is getting that DOM isn't getting and get rid of one more pass. That's all I have uh, for the future work and for the current work. Uh, for that, I'll go to questions if there are any. I think we got 10 minutes for questions.
David. I guess a uh, testing of this or proving validity of this pretty complicated, well, this, you seem, there's a lot of different cases. Um, do you unit test this? Uh, yes, there are, well, there are unit, te hmm. there are unit tests for the lowest level, which is uh, the range op operators. There's a lot of unit tests for that. Yeah, that code you had with uh, like all this, is yeah, it now? There's unit is tests for that. There are no unit tests for Gory or the Ranger. Mm -hmm. um, it's pervasive enough that stuff starts dying pretty fast if things aren't correct. So waiting for miscompilations to happen when the range is slightly wrong is, is can take some time to find a test it, case. It does. So, so, so one, of, one of my ideas was there if somebody would implement uh, the, uh, like instrumentation for every range we compute, put in code, if it doesn't hurt, abort. Like do sanitizing of computed ranges. Then we would immediately see at runtime well, so, we, we, we would faster see issues. Like a dump of what's going on? Is that what you're saying? Or? Runtime testing. Runtime testing. So, so basically, when, when, when Ranger computes uh, for an SSA name, a range, you then insert a runtime test. If the value is not in this range, abort. Sure. So it's basically okay. instrument doing bootstrap, do bootstrap with instrumentation. It will be very slow, probably. Okay. Uh, and, and you need to make sure that you're not in the next step optimize away the check with the wrong, possibly wrong range. Okay. Of course. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of room for improvement for, for the Ranger. And I know it's a complicated um, piece of the compiler and it's it, it, something as seemingly simple as the range operator being wrong will bubble all the way up to the top and you'll catch it in the threader in some weird path and then we'll see it in the next path. So yes, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, as I said, I'm, at least with the work that I've done in Floating Point, I am by no means an expert and I lean heavily on the community to help me implement the corner cases. I'm very open to suggestions on how to go about and I'm trying to commit patches slowly just to give others a chance to comment on them because I, I, I realize that that it takes a while for even the testers to even realize that anything is wrong because we have very good coverage for integers and for, for pointers. Stuff breaks right away, uh, but for floating point, it takes a long time you know, after I post a patch for somebody to realize that something went you know, haywire. Yes. Uh, I'm just joking, but it's very easy. If there's any regression, we just copy you on it. So. That's what I've been doing, but I hope that it, it gets to the point that that others can actually help with this. I'm I'm, I'm very happy that um, Richard Beener worked on, on on improving the backwards threader, and that was a big help because it, the backwards threader it, working on the threader was not part of the original plan. It was just something we did along the way to disentangle threading from VRP. But uh, anyway, I depend on the community. I'm ha happy to fix bugs, but I'm also happy to receive patches because there's a lot of stuff in, in Ranger, particularly the range op tables that can be done without any knowledge of the rest of the stack. We good? All right, David? So the, the ranger is, is a sort of an arbitrary property finder, yes, as it were, well, range, ranges of like, um, and right now for floating point ranges, you're basically looking at ranges on like the real number line and right. sort of is it or is it nan or, in, right. or infinite. Could, would it be possible and would it be useful, I don't know, to track ranges of exponents so that you could track that your like precision, maybe detect statically precision loss issues where you're adding a enormous number to, you know, where the exponent is like hugely positive with something we can, negative and like, it's like you're, this is. Can track anything you want. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's useful or not. I don't know. Uh, 
But if you have ranges of the numbers, you can just compute the ranges of, of the exponent from, from those uh, boundaries. It's actually equivalent information if you have the bounds. If you, for instance, if you would track this number has a very large exponent, then that implies that it is sitting on the very large range of the real line. Yeah, I guess, in, I yeah. guess how much precision do we know that eventually at some point you've lost it all in one Yeah, but that, that is the size of the range, right? If it's, if it's small, then it's a small range of exponents. If it's large, it's a large range of exponents. So it, it's, it's derivable. It's, it's one of the same. So, but yes. So, so in in case you you have a consumer of this kind of information, which I think we don't have yet, it would be interesting to like know um, the, the the precision you lose when you do an operation on these two ranges, for example. Because you could, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but you need to manually do that, do that for each operation. Right. Well, thank you very much.